Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and ladies and gentlemen, do you use the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine? If you ever seen some of my content where I do deep dives into something, the Internet Archive is like my favorite friend, okay? It's one of my most useful tools. It's the best way to go onto the Internet and just see a website from like three years ago, four years ago. Sometimes websites have been taken down. And you can go on the Internet Archive and type www.zelda.com. Don't go too far back. I made the mistake years ago looking down the Legend of Zelda rabbit hole. The Zelda website is entirely different way back in the day than what it is now. But ladies and gentlemen, to really give you an idea of it, the Internet Archive does more than actual websites. They cover books, they cover movies, they cover video games, they cover archiving a whole lot of digital products that ultimately have nowhere else to go. Now, I'm a digital preservationist, okay? At the end of the day, I understand that companies don't like piracy and for-profit companies don't like you downloading materials. And while I can kind of, you know, play the world's smallest violin for big companies, I ultimately care about preserving tech. I care about preserving the books. I care about preserving movies, video games, so on and so forth. When it comes to preservation, I'm a huge fan of even just like these services existing to preserve things like mods even, right? There are a lot of games like Vice City which have plenty of popular mods, one of them being Silent Hill Exotica, which we all thought was lost to time, but thankfully because of a community around it, they managed to recover the mod literally on the 18th of March, so less than a month ago this was recovered and you bet i'll be playing this on my channel in like a couple days anyways and this is again an example of why um you know gaming preservation or internet preservation is important without services like the internet archive a lot of these services a lot of these things would have been lost forever we need a server we need a service to store these kind of tools these kind of programs so again they never get lost to time taking this away is a complete detriment to you know, the preservation of our history and the stuff that we produce in the digital age. I think 30, 40 years from now, when I wanna play a game from my childhood, I should be able to play it in the least amount of steps possible. If I want to watch a movie like Hackers from 1994, all the way down 20 years from now, I hope I can watch it without it apparently being deleted by the actual copyright holders that aren't doing anything with the IP or the movie that far ahead, okay? Now, I understand Internet Archive is currently being sued by four of the largest publishers in the country. We're talking Hachette, HarperCollins, Wiley, and Penguin Random House, who have all come together to launch an attack on the Internet Archive. Now, this attack isn't something that's entirely toothless, which is what I want to get into. Now, to understand, the Internet Archive actually lost one of their first lawsuits in this situation against these four groups. And what the lawsuit initially talked about was their National Emergency Library. So yes, the Internet Archive hosted a library during the COVID-19 pandemic, the very early days of the pandemic. And what happened were they were distributing 1.4 million ebooks. And what they were using was something known as controlled digital lending, which is effectively like having a library in the digital sphere. So you know how we go to libraries? Have you ever been to a library in the real world? I have when I was younger, uh, sometimes in my teens, not so much anymore. Generally what you do is you go to the library, you have a library card, you book, you book out or rent out an actual book from the library, usually at no cost, and you get to use that book read it to your heart's content. Now you're gonna have to return it, you know, in like a week or two, but you can read that book and that book is bought by the library. They bought the license and they're basically distributing that one copy of the book between numerous people. Now, when you get into a digital library, meaning that the book is now a PDF file versus something real and tangible, it's not something like this. Here, this is a real flesh and blood book, okay? This is a D&D rule book for Cyborg, a Morkborg uh, rule book, and this is a physical copy. Now, this could also be a digital PDF. And if you were going to lend this, you would have to make sure that PDF file isn't just distributed for free. You'd have to have DRM, you'd have to have some form of you know, control. And there is, there was a wait list applied to it. There was forms of DRM. But during the COVID pandemic, during this national emergency library, the Internet Archive decided, forget DRM, we're just going to distribute however we want it. And obviously, for a lot of these for-profit publishers who were interested in making tons of money off of these books, were not excited at the prospect of what they believed to be piracy. 
And given that the Internet Archive acted, I'm almost a little bit sympathetic to the companies because at the end of the day, it really did appear like it was privacy with like the nicest veneer applied. So controlled digital lending has been around for a long time. And to give you a quick idea of what's exactly going on over here is effectively university sites even will use software like for instance, Digify, where basically they can control how many people can open and view a document. And again, this is entirely here to prevent things like, you know, distribution, uh, prevent like piracy in this case, because if you want only 10 people to view that specific PDF file, this is where you're gonna go to. Now, of course, the problem here is taking away those restrictions of, hey, we're gonna lend out this copy of a book, this digital copy 10 times, now you're letting 100,000 people, a million people get access to it. And I don't believe the Internet Archive was in any position to make that claim. That would be up to the rights holders if you're going to be looking at the law as it is. Now, of course, these four people accused the Internet Archive of enabling willful mass copyright infringement. And of course, within four months of basically this program running, the Internet Archive actually shuttered it off because they believed it wasn't going to be fruitful. You can even read it right over here. The National Library launched on March 24, 2020 and ended on June 16, 2020, when it ended up pissing off these four large publishers. Now, controlled digital lending, according to Spark in this case, uh, basically has three important principles. The library, so the Internet Archive, has to own a legal copy of that physical book by purchase or via donation or gift. A library must maintain an own to loan ratio, simultaneously lending no more copies than it legally owns. And the library must use technical measures, DRM, to ensure that the digital file cannot be copied or repurposed. And of course, this is the idea of the library too. So all these books, apparently this one here is checked out. So if I go to the checked out tab, I absolutely won't be able to view it. But of course, some books I could actually read. So if I go back, for instance, this one I can read right over here. I can hit read. I'm gonna actually block things out. I'm loading up the Internet Archives viewer just so I can read this material for myself. Now, of course, during the national directive, they clearly weren't worried about checking these things out. They just let people access them willy-nilly. So, of course, for the companies involved that are suing, they didn't necessarily like this because to them, it just seemed like it was piracy, which, to be honest, it kind of was. But you have to understand, me sympathizing with these companies is not really the, the play I want to make. I don't really care so much about their profits as I care about these books and these pieces of media being preserved for everyone around them. Now, obviously, you understand the difference between a digital library and a physical library, and you can kind of understand where uh, distribution of these books and why it may be infinitely easier and a little bit problematic for a digital library to send out hundreds of thousands of free PDF files that may or may not have the most robust, uh, I guess you could say, DRM applied to them. It may be piracy. It might be in some eyes. And that is what this lawsuit is all about. Now, of course, the Internet Archive is currently going through a rough moment. Now, while they host a near 10 petabyte collection of video or, or like uh, websites that are there archived, it could potentially be at risk. Now, obviously, looking over how much money they owe in their relief, if you actually read it real quickly, in the prayer for relief, where all these four scumbags actually want to go up against the Internet Archive, they want to basically make it so that the Internet Archive is actually charged with constituting a willful copyright infringement activity, their open library specifically. This may actually harm the entire library aspect of the Internet Archive through this lawsuit. Then, of course, they issue a preliminary and permanent injunction in joining Internet Archive and its agents, servants, employees, attorneys, successor, and assigns, and all persons, firms, corporations, active in concert and participation with it, from directly or indirectly reproducing, distributing, publicly displaying, creating derivative work, so on and so forth. And of course, what's really fucked up about this, whether now in existence or here and after created, and they order that all unlawful copies be destroyed. So again, they want to basically go out and start burning down the entire building, if so to speak, especially when it comes to this facet of the Internet Archive. Then they enter judgments for Internet Arch or plaintiffs against Internet Archives for statutory damages in an amount based upon Internet Archives' willful act of infringement of the works as alleged above. 
So again, there were some people that there were some people that looked into the entire accounting for an Internet Archive, and it wasn't really that difficult to do. There was full filings for their tax seasons, and of course, from 2018, it really does seem that the Internet Archive's expenses some were total around like 18 to 19 million dollars. And if they do get fined, they're paying basically a year of their expenditures to this. It's going to be damaging, but it's not going to completely bankrupt the project. In reality, the scary aspect of it is going forward into how preservation for books and digital lending is going to be. Now, again, one of the toughest things for me looking at it is, while I definitely can see where the Internet Archive is in the wrong, especially how they considered that, oh, I guess it's the pandemic, let's forget about copyright law, and this is why they're in the situation that they're in. But it's definitely dangerous to see one of the big only projects for preserving the internet actually is currently in a little bit of danger because of their reckless actions and them going up against some of the largest for-profit companies in the country. Now, of course, do I really believe this is going to kill the Internet Archive? No, I think there's a lot of don donors and a lot of people that are going to make up for some of these shortfalls if the worst tends to happen because the project is so goddamn important. Look, at the end of the day, nobody else is preserving the Internet and the files that are out on there. At the end of the day, if the Internet Archive goes down, we lose a massive chunk of human history right there. If you think preserving the internet isn't important, just think about the massive advancements we've had and the massive pieces of culture that we've developed and created and posted all over the internet. If that's not preserved, you could imagine this being like the burning of the Library of Alexandria, okay? A huge chunk of human history and culture suddenly dying out because of corporate greed. And that's sort of the situation we're looking at over here. This lawsuit is bad, and it's a lawsuit that unfortunately, while I want to side with the Internet Archive, it's not entirely in their favor given some of their actions regarding lending out digital books. They might have just crossed the line into straight up fucking piracy. But at the end of the day, should they absolutely be suffering for these actions, and should it impact the entire project as a whole? I really hope not. And it's hard for me to sympathize with these for-profit book publishing companies, especially when they're attacking a project and they're literally attacking actual libraries. One of the places where they do get a lot of traffic from, where they do get a lot of their customer base, you know, evolving from. It's a wild situation to witness, and it's one that you should definitely pay close attention to if you care about preservation. I know some of you guys come to my channel and you like preservation. You like when I do videos about emulation. You guys like that kind of stuff. And I know this topic is important for some of you out there, just like it's important for me. And I really hope the best for the Internet Archive. And while this is a hell of a lawsuit to witness, I really hope it doesn't spell the end of the Internet Archive. I don't think it will, but I really, really hope this gets resolved before they're dumping ass amounts of money into it that we're, we're recovering financially is just not a possibility. I hate big publishing companies. I really do hate big, poor, for-profit companies like this, especially when they target, you know, actual important causes like this. Insanity. But ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it. I am out.